This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here uh, with Martha Minow, who is a professor of law at Harvard Law School, also former dean at Harvard Law School, and someone who's worked in, gosh, so many different domains of the law, everything from constitutional law, civil procedure, uh, family law, and you've written an enormous number of books right, and edited as well. But uh, the most recent books of yours, I mean, after writing what well, you've got, Making All the Difference, Brown's Wake, Just Schools, Partners Not Rivals, Law Stories, I think I missed a few. But most recently, uh, you've got this book right here called Saving the News, uh, Why the Constitution Calls for Government Action to Preserve Freedom of Speech. And this one here, uh, When Should Law Forgive? Welcome, Martha. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So I want to start off by talking about this book, uh, When Law, When Should Law Forgive? Uh, you know, I, I think this is this is a work which, of course, it's a work of jurisprudence, but it also kind of speaks to other domains. It speaks to morality. It speaks to sociology. It speaks to psychology. Um, it it has implications, I think, that go well beyond the law. But but let's just start with the law, and and I think it's it's focused in many ways. At least it, it for me, it made me realize, or made me think again about how the American legal system, in particular, can be so unforgiving when it comes to criminal transgressions. But when it comes to, say, debts, right? You know, we can be incredibly forgiving. In fact, our bankruptcy law is one that people all around the world, uh, they come to America to file for bankruptcy and they emulate our bankruptcy law. And indeed, our bankruptcy law is in many ways uh, a secret to our economic success and, and innovation. And I think it, it kind of harkens back to this idea that in America, we can reinvent ourselves, right, in a continuous way. We can always go out to the frontier, right? You know, whatever happens on the East Coast, that's fine. You go out to California, <laughs> go out to the gold mining town and whatever, you can start from scratch. Um, but, but now the frontier's been closed. We, we, we've kind of, um, kind of doubled down on, on a very punitive approach to, to, jurisdic to at least criminal jurisdiction. And, and to some degree, uh, you know, our, our tort system can be very um, punitive. So, so why do we, what accounts for this dichotomy? Why, why do we, how can we carry around both of these notions simultaneously within our jurisprudence? It's a, it's a terrific question. And in fact, it's that juxtaposition of different treatments of blame in our legal system that so drew me to this, uh, this work. You know, Thomas Jefferson, who was in debt much of his life, uh, was, of course, one of the crafters of the U.S. Constitution, and he's insisted that there be a guaranteed national capacity for individuals and companies to declare bankruptcy and have a fresh start. Um, again, he lived it. But he also, because he was Thomas Jefferson, had a kind of political theory about it, and it's very related to what you say, of this idea of starting over, the idea of one generation not binding the next. Uh, he was a revolutionary, after all. And that is a deep element of the American ethos, and it indeed has helped to fuel a kind of entrepreneurial risk-taking, uh, which is supported by the treatment of corporate debts, debts business debts. We're not so forgiving as a society, however, for example, for student debts or uh, other kinds of individual debts. So those kinds of discontinuities and inconsistencies particularly uh, trouble me and compel me. There is this capacity to forgive that is deeply human. It is probably necessary to be able to get along uh, with uh, others in society. But there's also a punitiveness, uh, and I think we're out of whack when it comes to criminal punishment in this country. And, uh, but there may be something to learn from the treatment of bankruptcy. I think that one reason we're out of whack when it comes to criminal matters has to do with what you might call the political economy. What are the incentive structures for how criminal law is enforced 
and even defined in this country. To have elected district attorneys and prosecutors means that it's turned into a populist mode and it's easier to campaign on the claim of I locked up the following number of people than it is I, I contributed to reintegration of the following number of people. Why that is, that is beyond my uh, ability to fully explain, but it is deep in our culture and uh, the incentive systems that we have. So I think that we need a reset. It, it, it's, again, it's very striking to me that every major civilization every philosophy, every religious system argues for forgiveness. And some have even pursued society-wide restart button. You know, that was true of Hammurabi's code, that was true in the Bible, uh, the Jubilee year, to start over. I think we're kind of uh, reaching the point in this country, certainly when it comes to criminal law, that we need a restart. Yeah, the political economy story is, is pretty interesting because you know, in the in bankruptcy world, um, I think it's it's tempting to think in terms of debtors versus creditors, right? But at the end of the day, I mean, the the political power of the folks who are going around defaulting, <laughs> it's, I mean, forgetting about Donald Trump, at least, you know, they they don't seem to be all that powerful. And it seems to me that that um, from what I know about bankruptcy law, uh, bankruptcy laws benefit not just the debtors, but also the creditors, right? So, so the creditors have quite a bit of political power, and and they they support these rules, right? So, um, you know how to, is it's so is, is that is, yes? You yeah. know, I think in in some portions of Silicon Valley and other uh, areas uh, where entrepreneurship is so valued in this country. Some people say they won't even bet on someone who hasn't gone bankrupt once, that it's a kind of sign of being willing to be on the edge and take a risk. Um, once upon a time in uh, this country and in other countries, bankruptcy carried a moral uh, disapprobation, a kind of negative view, no more, uh, if anything, to the contrary. Um, and, and one reason you're right to say that creditors uh, support the bankruptcy system is that it is a, a way to acknowledge the interconnectedness of, uh, of, of all kinds of finance and to spread the risk and to come up with some way that people who have loaned money can get something back or can figure out a way to anticipate the risks that they, there will be a default, be able to put an economic price on that and be able then to charge interest accordingly. Um, that, that economic translation of the interconnections of human beings is well worked out in the bankruptcy world. We haven't done something comparable in the criminal context, even though the interconnections of, across people are, if anything, more dense and more complex. Right. I mean, I, I think the belief is that if, you know, we had debtors prison or if we, you know, lopped off limbs for people who didn't repay their debts, there wouldn't be a whole lot of borrowing going on. Right. I mean, it'd be very difficult to go into the business of, of lending if uh, default resulted in awfully punitive results. So it's a ter but, but terrific I think it, way to put the point that there's a system that the law helps to support of loans and credit that allows for the development of new enterprises, the funding of old enterprises. Well, there's similarly systems of need and violence and care and concern and stress that intertwine human beings so that uh, a woman who has lost custody of her children uh, to the state uh, may not be able to regain that custody unless she has a home. She can't get the home. She may then engage in criminal conduct. Uh, these are intertwined uh, causalities, not to excuse any individual the same way that it, when it comes to financial debt. There's a contribution, there's a responsibility of the individual, but there's also an embeddedness in social systems and practices. And what we're missing is a conjunction between the law and social practices that distributes those risks in the criminal context. 
But I think in the world of finance, we, we tend to make a distinction between kind of exogenous default risk and kind of strategic behavior, right? I mean, obviously, there's no clear cut, cut boundary. But, you know, when people are engaging in um, behavior in bad faith, knowing full well that they can kind of escape through bankruptcy, you know, whether it's kind of moving all your assets into your home in, in Florida and so forth. I think we, we tend to look askance at that, even if it's permitted. I don't think we, we kind of endorse that in a moral way. But when it comes to sort of exogenous shocks, whether it's, you know, some kind of health uh, adversity or, yeah. yeah, or some kind of corporate, you know, failure to generate revenue for your, for your small business. I think in that case, you know, we, we seem okay with that, but when it comes to criminal behavior, I think, I think we, we tend to think of that as always being strategic, right? We, we don't, we're, we're less likely to see the, those things as kind of a result of external forces or bad luck. Well, I, I think that the willingness or ability to see uh, the multiple causes and multiple contributions varies from people and incident. The economists do have, I think, a very valuable concept of moral hazard so that if there is insurance, you're more likely to take a risk than if there isn't. Um, if there's bankruptcy, you may be more likely to uh, spend too much than not. Those are, those are dangers. Those are costs of having a backup system. But there are costs of not having a backup system as well. Uh, and we need a concept that will acknowledge that. So how would we, if, I mean, the people who are in favor of very punitive judicial system, right, they're, they're concerned about incentives as well, right? And so, you know, if if in the in medieval church you could go and buy your way out of any kind of sins through through indulgences, then the belief was that, you know, nobody would have any incentive to engage in, in good behavior. So if if we were generous and and forgave people for engaging in, in criminal behavior, um how, how would we you, you know, how this is a difficult thing, I think, to it's difficult to convince people uh that uh if forgiveness is known ahead of time, right? For instance, uh, the, you, you talked about the jubilees, right? In the old days, right? If you forgave the debts every seven years, it's hard to imagine that anyone would ever have a seven-year loan. Right? <laughs> All the loans would be kind of two years or, or three years. So to what extent can forgiveness be kind of built into the system or to what extent does, does forgiveness have, have to arise out of some kind of, of ex post acknowledgement of, of human frailty. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's by accident that we use the word forgiveness in the context of debt, just as we do in the context of crime, as we do in the context of, you know, somebody bumping into someone else saying, forgive me. Um, these are uh, all falling under the general category of letting go of a justified resentment. It's not forgiveness if there isn't a justified resentment. There is a real violation. These are real. Um, forgiveness can, however, be built into not only human uh, decency, but also systems. So uh, the American legal system has many techniques for forgiveness that range from the police officer who can choose not to give me a ticket mm -hmm. uh, all the way to a judge who can choose to suspend a sentence or the, uh, the, the president or governor who can choose to pardon an offense. So we've built in plenty of techniques of forgiveness in the legal system. Amnesty, amnesty for uh, draft dodgers, amnesty for debt. I mean, one of the biggest amnesties around right now is the libraries that have discovered mm -hmm. if they have amnesties, rather than claiming to enforce the fines for books that are overdue, all these books get returned. So the recognition of the complexities of human psychology, the kind of counterproductive effects of over punitiveness are working their way into many areas, including the criminal law. I mean, there are many communities that it might surprise you to know are actually leading the way towards more forgiveness of crime. I mean, take Texas where uh, actually a confluence of 
evangelical Christians and people who are cost conscious looked at how much it costs to have mass incarceration. And they've really uh, explored and developed uh, more techniques to restrict and limit sentencing and open up the possibilities of giving people a second chance. Same thing in Oklahoma. I've had fascinating conversations with people in communities in Oklahoma who said, this is not working. We need to rethink. Yeah. But the, in terms of amnesties, right, these things are, are the way they're administered, uh, amnesties and pardons, they're... they're 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 not expected right they're not done according to a regular schedule right so uh when there was recent forgiveness of uh taxes on money that was stored abroad right i think the the idea was oh okay um i'm just going to wait for the next one right or i think in france they had a thing where they would forgive all of your traffic tickets every time uh, a new president was elected <laughs> and so people would sort of you know, try to try to wait, <laughs> hold on until that next president Collect was 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 elected. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, so again, that's there... the moral hazard. That's the danger of people taking unnecessary risks because they're counting on there being a backup or a way out. And there's also terrible abuses of the pardon power, um, mm -hmm. uh, as some presidents in recent history have demonstrated. Um, one of the uh, contrasts between forgiveness and ordinary law is that law tries to be regular, predictable, have general rules that are announced in advance that apply equally across people regardless of their circumstances. Forgiveness is the opposite of all of that, which is not to say that it's necessarily uh, subject to abuse or inconsistency. So President Obama developed a set of uh, rules and rubrics for when to give a pardon. It's very possible to develop uh, something that looks more law-like when we talk about the exercise of forgiveness. And I think we need that. I think that we need to develop, if you will, a jurisprudence of forgiveness. Some people were very critical of President Obama for not issuing more pardons. Uh, he, he had very, a, true. very strong beliefs about the... Um, the injustice of uh, criminal punishments, specifically for, for drug crimes, uh, and and yet he pardoned only a relatively small number, and, and I think he believed that he was hemmed in by constitutional constraints, but President Ford managed to offer amnesty for tens of thousands of people who avoided military service. Um, so is... Right. Is, is that a legitimate criticism, that, do you think? You know, President Ford took a class of people rather than doing an individualized uh, treatment. And what President Obama did, you know, it may well have been inadequate, but he wanted to bring some kind of uh, regularity to the process, uh, which required looking at each individual's uh, sentence. And uh, he actually had a team of people who came up with the principles, and the principles chiefly were that people should not be punished for a crime that subsequently uh, had a reduction in the sentence for that same offense, that that was treating people today differently than people who had committed the same offense previously. I think that there uh, are nothing like the criticisms that have been brought uh, towards President Trump, who basically sold uh, his uh, pardons either for money, campaign contributions, or for fame, uh, or incurring favor with particular people. So uh, there are there are real abuses, and it's striking to me that some other countries have come up with ways to make the pardon power not in the hands of one person, but instead either subject to judicial review, as in South Africa, or to have a a group of people, a cabinet, if you will, that decides who will get forgiveness. And that may well be better as a way to guard against abuse. That doesn't take away, however, the importance of having a capacity to forgive, to let go of justified mm -hmm. grievance, because, uh, you know, the pound of flesh, you know, can kill someone if it's demanded to be taken away. Now you talk about the book about restorative justice, uh, which is which is a movement that um, has been growing, I think, in in recent years. And restorative justice really, in in most cases, uh, involves victims, right? And it gives the the victims some kind of 
role in the rehabilitation or forgiveness uh, process. Um, to what extent does that uh, open things up to some element of uh, privatization of the of the of jurisdiction of jurisprudence and kind of the replacement of the rule of laws with the rule of of men? Uh, and, and to what extent does you know giving the individual judges and, and police officers kind of more discretion kind of replace the rule of law with the, with the rule of men? You know, those are, those are concerns that I take very seriously. Let's locate it in a broader history. I mean, once upon a time, there was no uh, intervention between vengeance that an individual has been harmed, may feel and may pursue on the one hand, and then the consequences for the person who's then punished. The development of a legal system was precisely to create some kind of a space, distance, between the vengeance of the one who's been harmed and the one who then has to be held responsible. Because one thing we know for sure, there can be a, a real outsized uh, response in the spirit of vengeance. Uh, it can be spiraling out of control and escalating, uh, as we see from cycles of revenge uh, across generations, across communities. So the cooling off the distancing that law represents is an effort to professionalize and to make the issue of blame and punishment not one that's resting on emotion but resting on rules so yes the uh the growing role for uh individual uh choices there may undermine precisely what law was supposed to do I'm actually more concerned uh, about that with what's called victim impact statements than I am with regard to restorative justice. So some states have adopted laws that say that the victim can participate at the time of sentencing and describe, here's what this uh, wrongdoer did to me and my life and my family. And the problem I have with that is it's precisely what you're saying. It's, it's making it, again, personal. But a further problem is it actually introduces a kind of subjectivity and inequality so that the punishment may turn on how appealing to the judge or the jury is the victim, how articulate is the victim, how much does the decision maker identify with the victim as opposed to what was the wrongdoer. Um, restorative justice is really, uh, in contrast, the idea that let's not go to court. Let's have the uh, conversation about blame and consequences in a circle with not just the wrongdoer and not just uh, the immediate victims, but others who are in the immediate community. This has really been pursued very effectively with regard to juvenile offenders and often in schools, um, where the goal is to actually prevent future harms like this and to develop some sense of what are, the, what are the meanings of these harms in people's lives so that the wrongdoer actually makes amends and agrees to undertake reparative action. That's the restorative dimension. Um, I think that it's, it, a real concern with it is it takes time uh, and it may require involvement of, of victims who'd rather have nothing to do with the wrongdoer. I think those are very genuine concerns. I think it should always be voluntary and not mandatory for just those reasons. But often a better solution for everybody can be worked out than just following the rules and locking somebody up. Mm -hmm. So often well, victims say what they yearn for is someone to say, I am sorry. I did wrong. You know, on the civil side, we have really good evidence that when there is malpractice uh, in the medical area, the offering of an apology actually is very often satisfies or reduces the desire for some kind of punishment, some kind of uh, civil uh, penalty. Uh, by the one who was victimized. It, we are human beings. We want to be recognized uh, for our humanity and have the cost to us and the harms recognized. And I think it's also very humanizing for the wrongdoer to have that chance to apologize. So in domestic violence situations, for instance, um, I mean, here, here's a situation where 
we have to balance the kind of the rest- restoration of the relationship while at the same time we we want to uh we, we we want to make sure that we protect victims, right? So is is there a conflict there? Is there a tension between the effort to kind of repair these the damaged relationships and to uh, uh, enforce justice in some way? Well, there surely I think, is. And I think of those domestic- as just as microchasms for, for the larger communities. You're, you're quite right. And domestic violence is a a harm to others, not just to the immediate victim, certainly to to children and others in the family, but also to uh, uh, the dignity and safety of anybody else who could be uh, facing the same kind of harm. Um, so I don't think that the decision uh, about whether there should be arrest or prosecution should be left entirely in the hands of the one who is victimized. However, um, I, uh, there is a, a very uh, real possibility that locking up the abuser is not going to help the one who's been victimized, particularly if that's a, the person who is the parent, uh, that's the person who's the breadwinner. I think that um, the power imbalance that is represented by domestic violence is what makes this discussion about forgiveness particularly fraught because uh, it's typically a woman who may say I forgive um, but it may be out of fear maybe out of lack of options maybe out of lack of economic options lack of psychological strength um, I, I don't think that any kind of restorative justice or uh, alternative to enforcement should be pursued in the domestic violence context without the first step, the first step has to be guaranteeing the safety of that person. And no discussion of an alternative should be pursued until that safety is guaranteed. Well, you mentioned that forgiveness requires an acknowledgement of, of wrong. And you uh, have done work on things like truth and reconciliation commissions that have appeared in a variety of post-conflict uh, arenas. Um, and you mentioned that as Nelson Mandela, you quoted him as saying that you know resentment is is a poison that affects the the victim far more than the perpetrator, or at least it's something with it. You know, you're trying to kind of get revenge in some way, but it hurts you more than it hurts the the person that you have or at resentment least as against. Much. At least as yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, but but for in a lot of these situations, it seems like the the trade off is between vengeance and and forgetting. Right. And sometimes people want to just forget and, and move on. And they see that as the only alternative to to uh, vengeance. Um, how, how can you both simultaneously forgive and not forget? Right. And remember and make sure that the 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 memory is sufficiently strong that the uh, probability of this occurring again is is reduced. It is striking to me that there are not just different words, but different social practices associated with forgiveness and forgetting. Uh, To forgive is very much uh, a process uh, that has rituals, uh, religious or otherwise, and it does not call for forgetting. It may be precisely to remember that forgiveness is is possible. And, And to your point about Nelson Mandela's comment and others, you know, what's so very fascinating to me is to see the medical evidence that those who forgive have better physical health, mental health. It is letting go of a burden, but that again does not entail forgetting. Uh, It's uh, actually just not carrying the rage, not carrying the justified resentment. Um, I think that um, the the experience of South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and now, you know, hundreds of communities have tried to do something similar, shows that it is possible to develop practices where, in fact, acknowledgement of the truth is part of the solution. You know, in South Africa, the apartheid regime denied its human rights violations. So developing a process by which the stories were told, uh, the wrongdoing was acknowledged, was in many ways more healing, more restorative, 
than any anything else that could have been developed. Um, so it, it it really is contextual. I wouldn't recommend uh, a restorative justice or a truth commission in every context, but in many contexts, it may be the best way to move outside of being caught in a terrible, terrible situation of denied wrongdoing or unbearable resentments. I remember a couple of years ago, I was teaching a class and, and the text was this um, book called The Sweet Hereafter, right? Uh, by Russell Banks. And, oh, yeah. you know, you remember this. And I think that the community was split over this, um, this accident, right? Where all these school the children bus. were killed. Yeah. And, um, you know, half the community just wanted to kind of put it behind them and move on. And there was a subset of the community that wanted to litigate, right? And in our judicial system, you know, we, we, we kind of, we put this on the, on the shoulders of private parties and we tell them, look, you know, it's your job to pursue these wrongdoers, right, through, through tort law. And, you know, if you, it's, it's almost like a public service that you have to do because it entails quite a bit of suffering to, to have to deal with these these things. So, um, I mean, f forgiveness is psychologically beneficial in some ways, but it's also kind of, isn't it doing a disservice if you don't also pursue justice at the same time? Uh, I've made a career in believing in the importance of pursuing justice, and even in the instance of a, uh, that terrible tragedy of a bus accident, there could be uh, public action, not just private action. There could be a attorney general action. Yeah. There could be uh, an action by uh, companies themselves could be held responsible. You know, the failures to actually confront wrongdoing are behind World War II, uh, behind, in some ways, what's going on in Ukraine. Um, the failure to actually say um, that how people have been treated in wartime is not acceptable, leads to resentments that are held on to for centuries and give rise to new conflicts or at least to the ability of unscrupulous leaders to appeal to those resentments. Um, and so finding ways to actually acknowledge, face, deal, uh, with the cruelties and the accidents and the pain uh, may be necessary to reduce the risks of their repetition. So how can we better um, bring people back into the community, particularly uh, post-incarceration? I mean, this, this we've seen movements to kind of ban the box and, and so forth, but what would it mean to give people uh, a fresh start in the same way that we give people a fresh start in, in bankruptcy. Are there any policies that we can promote besides ban the box that would make it easier for, for people to start afresh after some kind of criminal conviction? It seems like, you know, when someone goes to court and the judge or the jury convicts them and they're given, you know, two years in prison, that sentence lasts far longer than the, the two years in prison. It seems to last a lifetime. How is there a way that we can, as a society, um, you know, end the punishment <laughs> at the time right. when we, we said the punishment ends? You know, it lasts longer for uh, informal reasons, but also formal reasons. We have across this country laws that impose collateral consequences of crime, even after someone has fully served their sentence. They may be barred from having a license to be a barber, barred from public housing, barred from uh, applying for a government job, barred from uh, voting in many parts of the country. And I think that that kind of punitiveness is so counterproductive. People have paid their debt to society, is the way we describe it, and nonetheless, they're not allowed back in. I'm impressed by some very uh, in inventive reentry programs that actually make sure that there are employment opportunities, housing opportunities, that give people a fresh start, just as we talk about after bankruptcy, give people a fresh start. 
Uh, doesn't mean that they uh, live as though they never did it wrong. Um, they will have lots to deal with for the rest of their lives, but give them a chance for goodness sakes. Um, and it is, I think, very striking to me that in many communities it is possible to seal the record or expunge the criminal record, but it is very made very difficult. Why? If, if, the, if there's a law that says you can uh, seal the record or you say ban the box, not have it appear in your application for employment, why do we make it so hard? It's another layer of punishment. Um, the same way that we saw in Ferguson, Missouri, that the uh, legal system that was exposed when Michael Brown was shot depended on fines and fees that were yeah. imposed on poor people when they couldn't pay their fines and fees. So it just uh, accumulated and accumulated and accumulated. Um, and, you know, in part because the, the, the legal system there was... Uh, all depending on these tiny communities, each one having to uh, finance their own courthouse and their own uh, uh, police system, totally inefficient, and, uh, but, but producing, again, these cycles that are completely impossible. So are there alternatives? There are absolutely alternatives. I've, I've uh, had conversations, though, about uh, schools that are dealing with mandatory suspensions and then having a reentry problem. How do you reintroduce the student who's been out for two weeks and now is shunned by the other students? I don't think that's a recipe for building a sense of community and giving the person who made a mistake a second chance. Um, and there are other programs that are more successful. Do you think that's a case of the law driving the culture or is it kind of the culture that's, that's driving the law? Um, it's, it's, both, it's both, and, and sadly, uh, being caught in a kind of mindless cycle, again, like the political economy of the prosecutors who get elected only by saying that they can lock up more people. Uh, it, there's these cycles that, and sometimes we need to break the cycle and have a restart. Now, our constitution is, is I, think, I think it was the first one that had the word bankruptcy in it. And uh, I think we're, we're also uh, probably the first constitution that had the word press in it. And the press, as you mentioned, is the only kind of private business that has offered any kind of constitutional protection, which makes it in some ways almost a branch of the, the government, right? And sometimes do people do refer to it as kind of the, the fourth branch. Um, and a lot of people are, are concerned about the press, um, and they're concerned about the way the First Amendment is being interpreted, or as some people say, kind of weaponized. Um, and it's done in a way that is impairing people's level of informedness, which would enable them to be good citizens in, in a democracy. And you write about that in this book, Saving the News. And I, I think it's sort of a, it's a family business, apparently. <laughs> you, you're, uh, you're a second generation um, uh, Mano, who's interested in the in the press, but I, I was I was wondering in in this book, in some ways, as so many of us do, we, we kind of look back as to this golden age of the the newspaper, and it's a little bit of a puzzle, right? Because you know the 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 press was even though the press was subsidized by the the government in the early days, the press was not exactly for most of its history designed to promote truth. It was really, you know, there was the yellow press and, and there was a lot of political rivalries taking place in the press. But then it seems like there was this kind of golden age, not only for print media, but also for television and, and radio and, and so forth. And I guess from an economist perspective, what puzzles them is that that era was one where economies of scale gave rise to like local monopolies or, you know, less competition. Uh, and, and now we have lots and lots of competition or ease of entry, while at the same time we have these massive, massive conglomerates, right, that seem to constrict access to, the, to, to information. So, so was this really, was there really a, a golden age where people were kind of more likely to access good information and the truth? 
Uh, and if so, what, what really accounted for its both rise and fall? There have been lies and rumors and misinformation from the first time that human beings could communicate with each other. Uh, the, the commitment to give constitutional protection to the press in the U.S. Constitution, which, as you say, is quite distinctive and notable, uh, really stemmed from the founding fathers' own experience. They knew they could not have had a revolution without uh, the printing presses and the broadsides and the Thomas Paine statements and, and others. Not that everything that was said was truthful, but it was the possibility to have criticisms of government and criticisms of concentrated power. Um, and that has been characteristic of the media from the beginning of this country. De Tocqueville, when he visited in the 1840s, was so struck by how many Americans read news, even in the woods, even far away from mm. towns and cities. Uh, that has been characteristic of the United States forever even when there were periods when newspapers were basically run by political parties or run by uh, economic bosses. What was distinctive, however, was there were always multiple me media, multiple sources. And you're right that the barriers to entry are low now when we have digital social media. You don't have to pay, or at least not pay in cash, you do pay in your data and in your privacy, um, but there is concentrated power in terms of corporate power, um, particularly when you think about um, the ways in which moderation rules are bundled in with the platforms and not made trans transparent. So unlike someone living 100 years ago who could subscribe for a penny each to four newspapers and get different points of view, you know, you're getting your social media with a hidden uh, curation. You don't even know why you're getting what you're getting, but you're certainly not getting what I'm getting because we get different news. That's unprecedented in human experience um, and, and worrisome, I believe. Um, I think that another big change uh, is that this is not even the news industry. So... To the extent that the revenue sources for news from time immemorial have been a mix of patrons and subscriptions and advertising, much of those sources of revenue now are not available to people who are making uh, the point of reporting on news, uh, what they do for a living. And instead, it's, you know, social media, again, has, uh, uh, that's where some 70 to 80 percent of ad dollars have migrated in this country. Um, was there a golden age? There always were exclusions, even in the period you allude to when there were serious profits uh, for the big broadcasters, the two and a half uh, broadcasting networks that dominated this country in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, there were many, many people and many communities that never had their stories told. Um, and also, of course, biases in a, even an age that uh, claimed to be pursuing objectivity. But what there was that we have lost was even the ideal of seeking the truth. Uh, the uh, the embarrassment of being shown up for not having actually gotten the story right. Um, the recognition that maybe out of luxury, the journalism developed a set of professional norms, like you should have two sources, like someone who has an economic interest should disclose the interest when they are being used as a source. Those norms may have been born out of a kind of luxury, but they actually are part of what can be called the constitution of knowledge, the same way that peer review may work, not perfectly, but to help, to help improve the quality of academic uh, knowledge. Uh, the, the techniques of experimentation in science, these, all that we have, we're just human beings, we're all frail, we're all faulty, but we try to develop practices and social institutions that at least 
try to check those frailties and those failures. And right now, we've done the opposite. We've built a set of institutions that actually exploit human psychological fo foibles. You think about it, where is there full employment for psychologists right now? It's social media platforms mm -hmm. that are finding, you know, how is it possible to get beyond our rational faculties and keep us glued, addicted to something that we know is not very good to us? Um, that's not about this aspiration of trying to get to the truth. But it seems that during that golden age, at least for print media, it was these entities were, were constrained by the fixed cost of production. And so they realized that if they wanted to, if they, there was room for only one newspaper, the only way they could maximize circulation was to appeal to the broadest group of people. And if they targeted some small sliver, this would this would not this would not be as profitable as if they targeted a much wider group of people. Ah, but you see, even even so, the idea of bundled content uh, allowed for the newspaper to appeal to those who followed sports, those who wanted the crossword puzzle, those who were looking at the obituaries, those who were looking at politics. And it wasn't necessarily that the, everything was read by everybody, but now we have an unbundling. And rather than having cross subsidies so that the cooking can help pay for the investigative journalism, we have nobody paying for the investigative journalism unless it's philanthropy. Yeah. So when, when you're talking about the, um, the algorithms being opaque, do you think that if people, if the tr algorithms were transparent and people could choose, they would choose anything other than the algorithm they currently get? It seems like people get what they want, which may not be <laughs> terribly accurate or terribly well reported, but it, it does seem to be you know, what they would choose. And that's the argument that uh, proponents of easy access uh, would probably make, right? Wouldn't they argue that, you know, the, the First Amendment, the way they interpret it is entirely about allowing for the uh, free expression um, and that this would allow people, people are to... not choosing. Yeah. People are not choosing. What the algorithms do is bypass our choices because they don't even ask us. And they actually instead aggregate not just our own past practices, but some prediction of what kind of demographic group we belong to, and then serve up to us what they think we should see. The ways in which this is actually producing uh, amplification of racial and gender biases, just even in the ads that people are shown, what kinds of jobs are available. It's well demonstrated. And I don't think anybody wants that, but that's what the algorithms do. So, uh, you know, I, I am certainly not in favor of bypassing people's choice, but we don't have choice right now. That's not what's going on. So what can we do? I mean, you, you talked about the fairness doctrine. Uh, that, was, that the television stations and the radio stations were subject to for much of their history. Is, is there an equivalent type of fairness doctrine that we could implement in these social media platforms? Look, I, I think that one reason that the First Amendment and the protection of the press is so important is to guard against government uh, oppression I worry about the government being the editor and telling us what we should see and not see. The Fairness Doctrine was uh, uh, justified because of the scarcity of the signal for radio and television. And the government actually developed a licensing scheme because without it, nobody could be heard. It would just be a cacophony. And as a quid pro quo for what were really cheap licenses, uh, in exchange, the license holders had some duties, and one of them, characterized by the Fairness Doctrine, was to present competing sides of controversial issues and rights of reply. Um, that is not justified in a world without that kind of scarcity. Uh, and giving that kind of a role to the government is not something that I would support. At the same time, something that uh, could be called an awareness doctrine, as one of my students has articulated, uh, that actually requires uh, the, those who curate our information to make clear what is being left out, what's not being left out, 
is something to at least explore and could be pursued under antitrust authority or uh, consumer protection authority. You know, I talk about in the book how a group of undergraduates at the University of Chicago uh, in one semester came up with an algorithm that would use uh, language processing to tag content and identify its valence, its political point of view, and make available a competing uh, viewpoint. And look, I'm sure that the undergraduates at the University of Chicago are quite brilliant, but imagine they could do that in one semester. What could the great engineers at uh, Facebook or Meta, I should say, and Instagram and YouTube come up with if instead uh, of what they're curr currently doing, uh, they actually cared about giving people competing and contrasting viewpoints. Um, you know, I think that many, many, many people actually are not happy with the world that's being produced by uh, the, the dominance of a few social media platforms. And we have a particular danger with the destruction of local news because the scaling up of these large global companies is uh, characterized also by a divestment in the coverage of local incidents, like is there lead in the water in your local water supply? Um, where actually is there corruption in the writing of prescriptions for opioids? Um, there's nobody covering it. And this goes back to what the founding fathers understood. If you don't have the press that's separate from the government to be watching tyranny, there's tyranny, there's abuse. So I do think that there are techniques, there are solutions, there are no, no magic bullet, no magic wand, no silver bullet, but there are a series of steps that we could take that would uh, amplify the, the uh, a healthier ecosystem of information. Well, you mentioned a number of these remedies, including, of course, antitrust law. Uh, you talk about potential subsidies that could go uh, or at least some kind of mandated payments that could go to folks who are engaging in news reporting. But but you also talk about even making large platforms into uh, regulated public utilities in, in some way. Um, which of these remedies do you think is most likely to be on the, on the radar? Uh, I mean, it's clear that the platforms have given up on the belief that they will be pure, passive, distributors, right? I mean, the curation departments in all the large social media companies are getting to be quite big. They're hiring lots and lots of people, investing in a lot of algorithms, so much so that it's creating a lot of dissatisfaction. And uh, lots of folks are trying to, you know, <laughs> constrain their ability to curate this and, and pushing for, I guess, like a, a Marsh-like um, freedom of speech to be imposed on these, these, these entities. What, what, are, what are some of the realistic um, policy proposals that, that we could look forward to in the next decade or so? Well, it is not realistic to say to a social media platform or any digital source, don't edit, because that's a recipe for spam mm -hmm. and cacophony. There will be editing. That is not the question. The question is by what lights and with what degree of transparency. You know, I don't know where there could be some convergence, but the unanimous view that what we currently have is not good. That is one of the few points of convergence between Democrats and Republicans right now. And another interesting point of convergence is actually this concern over the destruction of local news. So the Local News Sustainability Act, which is pending in Congress, actually has strong supporters on both sides of the aisle. And there are versions of it being introduced in state legislatures. What I think is intriguing about it is it's not asking the government to give payments. It's actually suggesting that when you and I subscribe to a local newspaper, we should get a tax deduction. Mm -hmm. uh, and when a local company takes out an ad, it should get a tax credit. And there should be an exemption from the payroll tax when there's a hiring of a of a new journalist who's based locally. Th those are tax expenditures, fair enough, but it's basically giving the power to choose to individuals and to small groups and, and pluralizing it and not putting the content 
choices in the hands of the government. Well, so I think that that is uh, appealing to people of, of different political stripes. Of course, the decline of local news began long before the, the, the Internet. I mean, I'm, I'm a New York Times subscriber and have been for, you know, 50, 40 years or so. And, and, uh, and you know, my knowledge of local politics had began to decline as soon as I started. And I think a colleague of mine did uh, some research and found that the minute New York Times extended their paper subscription routes into uh, new geographies, the voting in local elections would, would drop off substantially, right? So, so that idea of, you know, people starting to ignore their, their local uh, local politics is is something that has been going on for for quite some time, and it's a little bit puzzling because of the if well, actually, actually, there, there's very good evidence that the destruction of local newspapers is highly correlated with re, with reduction in voting, mm-hmm. reduction in political participation. New York Times used to have coverage of local courts, used to cover. Uh, the boroughs doesn't do that anymore. Well, it certainly doesn't so, cover it in uh, the, midwestern it, cities. <laughs> if you subscribe to the New York Times in no, no, San true. Francisco, you don't know what's it's going true, on in San Francisco. It's true, and and so the, the destruction of any kind of local news is a major mm-hmm. problem, and it's a problem not just in this country; it's a problem globally. When you have global networks and they're not having people in local communities. But, you know, the uh, most of uh, the consumption of news ca- is, is uh, the appetites are large enough to have room for these national or global outlets as well as local ones. And the problem is the economics have dried up so that you can't have both. It's not the lack of attention. It's not, not the, the loss of interest. People are interested. They want to know. And it's a little puzzling, right, because, you know, Facebook, they can – they can target you down to your specific hobbies and your specific preferences. So they know where you live <laughs> and they could presumably, right, spoon feed you local news based on where you live. Um, it's just, uh, it, it just doesn't seem to pay in the same way that the other type of information does. Um, so, you know, it's so fascinating. Uh, even local, even, you know, urban papers that are closing right now make money. Mm-hmm. It's just not at the same scale that people are now demanding. And and that's why thinking about a public utility framework may be necessary to recognize there's some things that we all need, but uh, the eco- economic structures produce monopolies or oligopolies, and therefore there should be some public duties that attach to the uh, the people who are taking the private profit profits. So how does this require us to rethink what the First Amendment means? I think a lot of people think a First Amendment is constraining government activity, and that's all it is. But I think you argue that it, it, it actually is a little more complicated than that, and that it's, it's not just constraining, but it's also um, enabling in some ways. Well, it's very striking to me just to look at the history uh, of the country uh, whatever the First Amendment does or does not require, it has been consistent throughout American history with the existence of laws against defamation. It has been consistent with throughout American history with the laws regarding antitrust, uh, even breaking up uh, you know, owners of a newspaper and a broadcast in the same jurisdiction under the antitrust laws. So the, the First Amendment is not a get-out-of-jail-free card from any legal obligations, uh, despite what some people think. Um, there is a current uh, weaponization of the First Amendment that actually is very demonstrably linked to corporate interests, using it as a new anti-regulation technique, the same way that the contract and property clauses due process clauses were used at the turn of the 20th century. Now the First Amendment is being used to attack, to attack what people historically have thought of as obviously lawful techniques, like mandatory disclosures uh, by publicly traded companies of their actual risks and liabilities. There are people now questioning whether or not that violates the First Amendment. Um, when Justice uh, Kennedy uh, wrote the opinion striking down campaign finance laws. He said, well, instead what Congress can do is require disclosures. The Fourth Circuit 
not so long ago, struck down a required disclosure. This is madness. There's something out of control here, and it is not what the First Amendment was designed to do. Uh, and, it, and it could actually run the risk of killing the democracy. Uh, the Constitution is not a suicide pact, said Justice Frankfurter. And so if it is interpreted in a way that actually destroys the very system, then something went off the rails. Well, so that takes us back to political economy. And uh, so do you think that the interests of the large um, platforms have changed in the last 10 years or so? Have they begun to realize that their interests are aligned with a maybe an improvement of public discourse in some way? I think it's so striking to see the leaders of some of the major media tech companies saying, we need regulation. This is bigger than us. Um, they're also, of course, uh, mindful that they would be able to pay to comply with the regulations more than some of their new competitors would. But I think that there is a kind of realism about it, as well as a recognition that in one way or another, these global companies are going to be regulated. They are being regulated by Europe, by Australia. Um, and the United States failure to regulate doesn't mean there will be no regulation. Uh, so which regulation would you rather have? And how about having one where there's an uh, actual chance to participate and influence? Uh, I think that uh, also it reminds me of a conversation I had with someone who worked at uh, DeepMind, one of the AI uh, companies uh, uh, that's a subgroup of one of these big tech companies in England and who actually said, we are doing things we don't really fully understand. And we shouldn't be the only ones deciding what happens next. I think that that kind of recognition is, is now hitting a lot of people who work inside of tech companies when it comes to the information ecosystem. Uh, and it's larger than any one company, and it's larger than any one engineer, it's larger than any one CEO. And that's why we have governments. That's why we have a political process to talk about when there are externalities, when there are consequences for all of us. How do we justify um, uh, how power is exercised? How do we reconcile competing values? This is not something to be done in silos. This is something to be debated and resolved collectively. Well, I couldn't let you go before asking you something about education because you, you, you studied education before you studied law. And uh, when you were um, dean, uh, also an after dean, you also uh, headed up some curriculum reform initiatives at Harvard Law School. Um, how, do, how do we need to think about legal education going forward. Uh, you know, legal education is changes very, very slowly. Um, you know, the case method uh, goes back to the early 20th century, and it's, it's, it's been with us for a long time. The subjects that people study in law school, the, the core curriculum kind of has been relatively constant for a long time. Uh, I think you've been instrumental in, in encouraging more kind of clinical work while in, in law school. Well, what are some of the changes that we need to think about in legal education? You know, medicine developed from a kind of practice where you were as likely to die in a hospital as not uh, going to a hospital or not going uh, at the turn of the 20th century to uh, really the contemporary world with remarkable advances. It advanced because of actually using data and studying what works and what doesn't work. We are at the dawn of that era in law, whether it's looking at whether a law works or looking at whether legal education is working. Uh, and I do think that there, this is a period of some great innovation, uh, much more of a focus uh, out of necessity on what people are learning and not learning. Uh, COVID actually introduced experiments by necessity uh, and people are paying much more attention to what works and what doesn't work. So I think that the reliance on precedent and unchanging practices is uh, itself going out uh, of style in legal education. Look, I think education in general, um, this is uh, potentially we're on the brink of a golden age where we have much more understanding about how people learn, how children learn. It's different than how adults learn. 
uh, and uh, what is the how much time should be spent on each task and we can actually personalize that and uh, I always say to students um, one of the curricula that you need to study here is how you learn because as a lawyer you're going to spend the rest of your life needing to learn new things well being much more mindful and explicit about how we learn and what you need to know um, that I think will be part of legal education and I think education generally going forward. I think that would be the basis for an entirely different conversation that we could have, but we don't have time for that. So Martha, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, saving the news, uh, check this out. And also when should law forgive? Great chatting. Thanks for the great questions. Great discussion. Hope to talk to you again soon. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.